there will be no links on the radio links page tonight because I'm not at home and don't have the facility to update the page. But we will be back to normal within three or four years, so don't worry about that. As I said, I was in Sacramento earlier in the week for a debate on whether drugs ought to be legalized. It was at a school of law. We had a nice turnout, about 100 people, filled the lecture hall, standing room only. And uh, the negative side of the debate was taken by a U.S. attorney, a federal attorney, who has had some experience prosecuting drug cases. And, of course, he told the audience about all the horror stories, the terrible things that have happened when people have been on drugs. And he was particularly concerned about methamphetamines and terrible things that have happened. But as I tried to point out in the debate, what he was telling the audience were terrible things that happen when drugs are illegal. And he didn't have any stories to tell about horrible things that had happened before there were drug laws, because he didn't know any of those things. He also, of course, pointed out that there had been no studies, no scientific studies showing in any way whatsoever that marijuana has any medicinal properties whatsoever. And when it was my turn to speak, I pointed out that he was absolutely right. And I asked the audience, do you know why there have been no scientific studies showing that marijuana has medicinal properties? And I paused and waited and waited and waited. And I said, do you know? Well, the answer is because it would be illegal to conduct such a study. Marijuana is illegal. Where are you going to get 100 people who are willing to break the law by smoking marijuana? If you were asked to be in such a study, you better hope you would be in the control group rather than in the group that actually got the real marijuana, because if you got the real marijuana, you'd be subject to go to prison. He also pointed out when I talked about people who had gone off to prison for 10 years or more for smoking marijuana, he pointed out that there has never been a single person who has been sentenced to 10 years in prison for mere possession of marijuana. And again, I had to point out that he was absolutely right. And the reason is that if you have any marijuana in your pocket at all, they consider it to be enough to qualify you as a distributor of marijuana, not a simple possessor of it. And so the result is you are not tried as a possessor or smoker of marijuana. You're tried as a drug dealer. And that's how you can get 10 or 20 years in prison. And we went back and forth like this. And fortunately, there's not a lot that he can argue. I tried to point out in my opening statement that the rule of law depends upon the law being simple, that it can only work if people can know the law. And in the old days, there were just two simple laws that comprised the common law in England and then in America. Richard Mayberry has done a very good job of describing the way this developed in his book, Whatever Happened to Justice. And those two simple laws that everybody was acquainted with were, number one, do all that you have promised to do. In other words, the law of contracts. If you promise to deliver a product to someone, deliver the product. If you promise to work for someone a certain number of hours, then work those hours. If you promise to pay somebody a certain sum of money, then pay that certain sum of money. And if you are accused of not doing so, then you can be hauled into court and a jury of your peers will decide simply on the basis of the facts. Did you do what you promised to do? And if you didn't, you can be ordered by the court to make restitution. The second simple rule in the common law was do not impose on somebody's person or property without his permission. In other words, don't trespass. Don't uh, intrude on anyone in any way whatsoever unless he gives you permission. And again, if someone were accused of something, the victim would go to court, give his side of the story, the accused would give his side of the story, evidence would be presented on either side, and the jury simply had to decide on the facts. Did this person intrude on somebody else's property? Or did this person actually hit that other person? Or did this person kill that other person? No attorney had to instruct the jury on the law and say this is the way the law is and so forth because the law wasn't complicated at all. It was very simple. And as long as it was that simple, everybody knew where he stood. There were no real crimes against the state, although in England you had a king who could overrule the common law if he wanted to. And one of the most important things when the colonists established a new country in America was to remove that ability of the king or the government to overrule the common law. And for the first 100 years of America, that's pretty much the way it was. Yes, there were exceptions. Yes, at the end of the 19th century, Jim Crow laws started. Yes, certain states had dry laws and some other things. But basically, people knew what the law was, and they did not have to become experts in order to know to stay on the right side of the law. But along about the end of the 19th century, all that began to change with the progressive era. And the government got bigger and bigger, and the laws got more and more complicated. And more than anything else, they, the laws were no longer based on the two simple principles, do all you have agreed to do, and do not intrude upon somebody's property without his consent. And as a result of that, we now have laws that govern the way people acted and the, what, and the things that people could do with their own lives, regardless of how this affected other people's lives. And perhaps the culmination of that, along with the passage of the income tax, the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, uh, World War I, and so many other things, but a big culmination of that in 1919 was the passage 
of the amendment outlawing the importation, sale, and consumption of alcoholic beverages. In other words, prohibition. That came about in 1919. And during the 20s, a whole mess of things developed because what we had here was the government institutionalizing what is called a victimless crime. And a victimless crime is very simply a crime in which there is no victim to testify against the accused in court. Some people say, well, there are victims, certain people are hurt, and so on. But those people never come forward. Those people never register a complaint against the accused. People may hurt themselves, but they're not going to testify against themselves. And because there is no victim, the state has to go about catching the so-called criminals and prosecuting them in much, much different ways. They now have to conduct sting operations. The police have to lie and pose as alcohol dealers, as was the case in Prohibition. And more than anything else, the entire alcohol business is taken out of the hands of Jim Beam and Johnny Walker and put in the hands of Al Capone and Babyface Nelson. And they ruled the liquor industry, and they ruled it with Tommy guns. And monopoly territories were fought over, and the St. Valentine's Day massacre was an example of what happens when liquor companies are no longer involved, but gangs are involved. And you had police corruption, and judges bought off. And you had people dying of drinking bathtub gin because they didn't know what they were getting. They were sometimes getting toxic substances without realizing it because no longer could they read a label or depend upon the reputation of a manufacturer, but instead had to trust in some stranger who was selling them liquor out of a baby carriage. Well, all of this finally ended in 1933. The noble experiment was just too much for America. And even those people, most of those people, who had felt that good would come from this were ready to give it up by 1933. And another constitutional amendment was passed to end alcohol prohibition. And the strange thing happened right at the end of prohibition. The crime rate, which had been rising all through the 1920s, peaked and started falling. And those people who think that poverty causes crime ought to look at the Great Depression because all through the 1930s then, the crime rate and especially the rate of violent crimes and homicides were falling. And they continued to fall until the 1960s when the war on drugs started. And then alcohol prohibition came all over again. And all of the ills and evils that had occurred in alcohol prohibition were back with us again in drug prohibition. And the result of that now is so much worse than it was in alcohol prohibition because it isn't 14 years since it was passed. It's been just about 40 years that we have had to put up with these drug laws. And all sorts of injustices take place, all sorts of police corruption, all sorts of gang warfare, all sorts of innocent people killed in the crossfire. You can join the show by calling 1-800-510-TALK or 1-800-510-8255. Isn't that nice? We have two different numbers. 1-800-510-TALK or 1-800-510-8255. All right, it's the same number, but so what? We're on a low budget. Anyway, we were talking about what happens with the drug war. One thing we need to understand is that it, it isn't really difficult for a civilized, free society to reduce violent crime to a minimum. You're not going to stamp it out completely, but you can reduce it to a very small minimum, which we could even might say would be tolerable, although that's not an appropriate word for it. But it is absolutely impossible to stamp out victimless crimes, crimes of drug-taking, drinking, smoking, prostitution, gambling, whatever those things may be, where no one is intruding on someone else's property and where everyone is doing what he agrees to do. Now, we need to distinguish between drug dealers fighting over a territory and killing each other from the simple distribution of drugs. Obviously, anything that includes violence is not a victimless crime, even if it's associated in some way with something that is a victimless crime, like drugs or prostitution or gambling. But the important point is that because it is so impossible to stamp out victimless crimes due to the fact that these are things that people want to do, and are going to find a way to do, and people are going to find a way to supply the things that people want, because it is impossible to stamp that out, the police become more and more desperate and more and more aggressive in their attempts to enforce victimless crime laws. And they engage in sting operations. The police are taught to lie, to pose as drug dealers, and thereby to try to ensnare people. But more than anything else, because there is no victim to testify, the police have to rely on all sorts of nefarious methods to bring convictions, the police and the district attorneys. And some of the examples of this are, number one, the asset forfeiture laws, where they swoop in and take people's property and then make the people sue the government to get it back, and in some cases, take the property and then settle on giving some of the property back if the person will admit to having committed some drug crime and going to court, pleading guilty, and taking a sentence. In other cases, the mandatory minimums are imposed. These are heinous impositions of sentences like 10, 20, 30 years life imprisonment without parole for the distribution of drugs. And these mandatory minimums are not designed to catch and put away the drug kingpins. They are designed to terrorize people. 
catch somebody, accuse him of drug possession, and show him that he could get a 20-year sentence, and then tell him that if he will plead guilty and save the court the trouble, he can get a plea bargain of five years in prison or seven years in prison. But even worse is the fact that they catch a real live drug dealer, and then they say, you're due to go up for 30 years, but we can waive the mandatory minimum if you cooperate and turn in other names. And what happens then is the kingpin turns in a whole bunch of names because he knows a lot of people who work for him, but the lower level guy doesn't have so many contacts and can't cooperate as much. But even worse, it leads to the turning in of people who aren't even in the drug trade. And what happens is a drug dealer then cooperates by giving names. And the names are given, and the result is that innocent people go to prison. Because when those innocent people are facing the mandatory minimums, they have nobody to turn in. And so that's the end of the line, and those people go off to prison. Yes, the drug dealer goes to prison, but instead of him getting the 20-year sentence, he may get off in 18 months or three years or something of that sort because he had names to provide to the district attorney. Now, these may seem to be problems with the laws that need to be corrected, need to be reformed. They are not. They are inherent in the nature of trying to prosecute victimless crimes. It is inevitable that we would have asset forfeiture laws. It is inevitable that we'd have mandatory minimum laws. It is inevitable that we would have police corruption. It is inevitable that we would have gang warfare. And there is no way you can separate it from the drug laws themselves. Hence, the only answer to all of this is to repeal all the drug laws, every single one of them, and get the government out of this. And I am certainly not talking about making drugs legal and having the government regulate them, because government regulation through the FDA has caused more deaths than the use of all illegal drugs in the 20th century. And as a result, what we need is to get the government completely out of this. And until we do, we will be faced with all the things that they tell us are so terribly wrong with drugs, including drug overdoses, drug problems that wouldn't be in existence if drugs were legal. That doesn't mean no one would ever become addicted to drugs. People become addicted to drugs, to alcohol, to fatty foods, to all sorts of things. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that a lot of innocent people have gone to prison, people who never even took drugs, let alone sold them, and yet were convicted in drug cases. And I've discussed some of those cases on the show in the past, and I won't go into them now. But there are a number of such cases cited and uh, related in my book, Why Government Doesn't Work. That was my campaign book back in 1996, and it contained a good deal of information about what has happened to the law in this country and what has happened to government and how our political parties have merged and be, both become the party of big government. And that book went out of print uh, two or three or four years ago, but I'm happy to say that it's available once again, and you can actually download the entire text of the book from the Internet. If you go to libertyfree.com, this past week we added that to Failsafe Investing, the commercials for which you've probably been hearing on this show. Why Government Doesn't Work is available if you just go to www.libertyfree.com. Liberty Free is all one word. And there you'll see a description of the book. And for only $9.75, you can download the entire text of the book. And not only does it go into the principles of government and why government doesn't work, why no government program is going to produce the results touted for it, but it also goes over specific government programs like health care, education, welfare, and on and on and on. And, of course, one of the big areas that it touches on is foreign policy. And speaking of health care, I'm not sure where we stand now in Congress with that, but yesterday, I guess it was, the House voted to pass the president's prescription drug bill, which will add another $400 billion to the money that you and your children owe future generations or bondholders. And it's interesting. I have not been able to keep up with the news the last few days, but somebody did get to me some information that they kept the vote open, even though the vote did not pass when the votes were counted, they kept the vote open so that President Bush could actually contact specific representatives who, have voted, uh, who had voted against the bill, the prescription drug bill, and twisted their arms until they finally agreed to change their votes from nay to aye. And the result was that when they finally got enough votes to win by one vote, they closed the voting then. Now, I'm not sure where that leaves the bill. I don't, this was a conference bill, meaning the Senate and the House had passed different versions of this drug prescription add on to Medicare, and now the House has approved the conference compromise between the two houses. I don't know whether the Senate has approved it yet. Obviously, when and or if the Senate does, George Bush will sign it because this was what he wanted. And who knows what Bush promised to these uh, straying representatives to get them to change their votes or what he threatened them 
perhaps running somebody against them in the primary next year, or if he was promising them rewards, you'll pay for it. George Bush won't pay for it. George Bush doesn't promise a representative that George Bush is going to write a personal check for $10,000 to the representative. George Bush promises him that he'll get through a $5 million, $20 million, half a billion, who knows what bill for his district so that he can use that when he runs for re-election. But that's the way politics works this way. The rule of law, the idea that there are just two common rules that we all need to be aware of, do only what you have promised to do and don't intrude on someone's person or property without permission, those laws have been buried in a mountain of legislation that tell us how we must live and whose responsibility it is to pay for everybody else and how everybody else is responsible for everybody else. And so Medicare will become much, much, much more expensive in the future. And in the process, it will run up the price of health care even more. And that will mean that seniors will pay even more out of their own pocket, despite now having the drug prescription benefit. Of course, a lot more is going on. The president keeps talking about how we have, we, yeah, right, we have liberated Iraq. And I guess Iraq is a liberated country. I guess the definition of a liberated country is one in which there is an occupying power and there are, enemy, are foreign soldiers on every street corner with big AK-47s in their arms, where there are checkpoints and roadblocks all over the country, where you have to carry an identity card, and where half the country is in ruins from bombs and missiles and, and other destruction. I guess that's the definition of a liberated country. And if so, we should be so lucky as Iraq as to have been so liberated. Well, let's go to the phones now and see what the rest of the world thinks. Let's talk first with Roger in Clymer, New York. Good evening, Roger. Well, good evening, Harry. Thank you for taking my call. My pleasure. What's up? Well, I just wanted to tell you that, um, you know, this is the anniversary of, um, I guess, JFK getting assassinated a few years ago. Is it actually November 22nd? Is that the day? Yeah, something like that. I, I, you know, all this time I've been thinking it was November 23rd, and I'm sure you have heard many, many times in your life people say that no one can forget where he was on the day that JFK was killed. Well, apparently, I can't even remember what day it was. So. Right. Well, well, anyway, you know, up on a website, they've got a new book out, and it's basically this. It says, here's the facts. JFK supported the coup d'etat, which resulted in the assassination of a, a Vietnamese you know, president. Right. It says, 21 days later, he was assassinated. 48 hours after he was murdered, the FBI deported a, a French assassin. A fact not reported at the time, not even the Warren Commission. Wait a second. He, uh, this French assassin was deported from the United States? Right, right. I see. How did they know he was, uh, or whoever wrote this, how did yeah. that person know that the Frenchman was an assassin? Well, anyway, but this, you know, this book weaves a deal on how other countries and other, quote, organizations got involved. And now, But the reason that they got involved was supposedly because JFK got involved in their personal affairs. See, he all right, was, all right, wait a second, so I understand you. You're saying all these other people, foreigners and so on, got involved in the assassination of JFK? Right, yeah, because he supported the coup d'etat that resulted in the assassination of, of, uh -huh, of someone. GM in, yeah. And see, this is just how, I mean, that's something that, if true, and you know, I'm not saying it is, um, this is, JFK has never figured that it could come back if to haunt him. This is what happens when we start busting it and muddling in on other countries' affairs. You don't know what's going to happen in the aftermath, you don't know if, if someone else is going to get pissed off. You don't know if, you know, you don't know what's going to happen to you or your country because you're sitting there saying, well, we prefer this government instead of that government, and right. we think you should be a democracy instead of the dictatorship that you are, and, and we don't like you because you're the most evil dictator in the world, you know, as if they have a ranking of them. And, I mean, what I love is how... Can you imagine what would have happened if, like, say, China or Russia invaded us because of what happened at Ruby Ridge in Waco? Sure. And, but well, it's a, and it's a good analogy. Yeah, but, but here we are sitting there. Well, we prefer this government, you know, in Vietnam instead of that government. We prefer this person in Vietnam instead of that person. And all, all of a sudden, you know, so we, you know, go through this coup d'état and, and this, that, and the other. And then all of a sudden, you know, other people get pissed off, and you just don't know where it will lead. Of course not. And that's that's one of the big problems. Well, there's really two problems. First of all, as you're pointing out, uh, American officials are interfering in the affairs of other countries and creating all kinds of resentments and all kinds of desires for revenge. But secondly, so little of it is known to the American people at the time that it happens. There is very little discussion of it in the newspapers or on television or anywhere else, although with the Internet now, we are much, much, more, much, much more aware of co contemporaneous events than we would have been back when Diem was assassinated in Vietnam and so on. We knew Diem was assassinated, but it was only many years later that it became known that it was the United States government that engineered the assassination. And 
And now these things happen, and somebody, whether an American or some foreign foreign correspondent, finds out and relays this information on the Internet, and it gets spread around the United States, and that's a very, very hopeful sign. So uh, we have hope that things might improve. But the interesting thing that uh, flows from what you're talking about, too, is the unpredictability of American support or opposition. Diem was the favorite of the United States government, Diem being the dictator or supposed president, but really the dictator in South Vietnam, and he was supported by our government for many, many years, and then finally at some point they decided that he was no longer useful to them and that another general there would be able to make some kind of a settlement with the North Vietnamese that the United States government thought was necessary at that point, and Diem wouldn't go along with it, so they assassinated him and his brother, uh, who was the chief of the military, there. And that's not an unusual situation. For years and years and years, our government supported Manuel Noriega, the dictator of Panama. They even brought him up to, uh, to Georgia, to the School of the Americas, to train him in many, many ways. And then one day they pulled the rug out from under him, and the United States government, uh, the United States military, invades Panama, arrests Noriega, brings him back to Florida, puts him on trial as a drug dealer, and he's now in prison in Florida. Rafael Trujillo and the Trujillo family ran the Dominican Republic for 30 years with the support of the United States government. Without the support of the United States government, he would have fallen years and years before. And then finally, in the 1960s, the United States government got tired of him, and they engineered a coup that got rid of the Trujillos. And there's another good example. There are many examples, but there's one good one, and the fellow's name just, I don't know, it keeps escaping me. Oh, yeah, I remember what it is. Saddam Hussein, who was supported by the United States in the 1980s in his war against Iran. And then one day, suddenly he became the enemy of the hour, the enemy du jour. And the United States uh, went after Iraq in 1991 and, of course, again in 2003. So uh, you pointed out a very good part of uh, this whole problem. And it doesn't really matter whether this particular book you cited is really on on the mark with regard to the facts that it claims to be providing, because the evidence is there for all of us to see that, above all, our government has meddled in country after country after country around the world, and every time it does, it creates thousands and thousands, if not millions, of more enemies of the United States. And even if Americans aren't familiar with it, you can be doggone sure that the people in the country involved are well aware of it. Yeah, well, anyway, that, that was it for now. I want to also wish you a happy Thanksgiving. Well, thank you. We have a lot to be thankful for, and part of it is that the Founding Fathers gave us such a good start in this country that it's taken a long time to deteriorate, and there's still hope we can turn it around. Thanks for calling, Roger. We'll be right back after these words. We are going to go right back to the phone now and talk with Bob in Alabama. Good evening, Bob. Hey, Harry. How are you? I'm just fine. What's on your mind tonight? Well, I have this image in my mind of of Harry Brown sitting in a a Hilton in the (laughs) hotel room making this phone call, because I've been there. (laughs) I hope you're using a uh, phone card as opposed to the direct dial out because I'll tell you what, speaking of victimless crimes, <laughs> the cost for making that phone call has got to be pretty steep. Yeah, I know. Well, fortunately, it's being made from the radio studio in Washington to me, and even if they bill me for it, I don't care because it won't be anything like a hotel bill would be. <laughs> so I know what you're talking about. And yes, I am sitting in the hotel room at the San Francisco Hilton in San Francisco, and uh, very glad to be here, but most important, glad to be here with you tonight, Bob. And Thanks. Look, I, I just wanted to t- touch on a couple points. One is um, I had a barber uh, in uh, Alabama that uh, was busted for uh, for dealing. Um, I'm not sure what, exactly what he was dealing, but uh, he went away for for two years uh, for for his dealing. Uh, and again, I'm not even sure if it was dealing. He might have just been possession. But uh, I can I can tell you that uh, his life. I mean, can you imagine two years? Two years seems like a relatively long, uh, short period of time. Uh, uh, your but, life your life goes completely away from you. You have to start all over again when you come back. Exactly. And he, he was destroyed. His life was destroyed. His family was destroyed uh, in those two years that he was away. And, uh, and well, you can imagine how many divorces occur even if the wife or spouse knows that the other spouse was innocent. Uh, just the fact that they're separated for so long. It's like the cases where a child disappears. And two years later, the parents get divorced even though they had a happy life together before the tragedy arose. Things like that can destroy a family. Right. And and uh, and it did, and it destroyed his life. Uh, and I have a, a nephew as well that uh, was uh, uh, he wasn't <laughs> he wasn't dealing, but he got involved with some uh, uh, smuggling of uh, of drugs across the uh, Canadian border into the United States. And uh, and he also spent a couple years away, and he's uh, he's now back at home uh, and, and and doing okay. But I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, it, it destroyed him. I mean, he, he was uh, he was doing well in school. Uh, and, and and his life is now, uh, you know, he, he's having to recover from all of that. And he, it was a victimless uh, crime, really. Um, I don't know exactly how to how to uh, uh, address it. I mean, it doesn't sound good, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Sure, of course. But uh, he was, uh, he's a good boy, and uh, and he's doing all right now. But uh, for a couple of years, 
<clears throat> you know, he was put away and, uh, you know, washing dishes and um, uh, was a victim. You know, sure. All right. Um, but I also wanted to talk about victim, you know, crimes where there is a victim. Yes, of course. And, um, you know, looking back at the uh, uh, the old, uh, you know, English law, it used to be that uh, that if you did, in fact, do something to someone to really harm them, that uh, that the victim had some uh, recourse, um, whereas today the debt is paid to society or paid back paid to, to the state. Right. And uh, it seems to me that uh, you know it would really be better uh, better for everyone if uh, we couldn't re uh, reinstitute some sort of uh, restitution. Uh, yeah, restitution where the uh, where the uh, the criminal uh, was forced to pay back to the victim. Uh, yes, very definitely. Restitution should be the first and foremost, and then if the criminal seems to be unrepentant, then some sort of punishment involved also. Uh, we sometimes don't know whether harm has been done accidentally or intentionally, but it's harm nonetheless, and the person who committed the harm must pay for it, and the person who received the harm must be made whole. And that's the first duty of the state, and then punish if necessary in order to discourage further acts of the same kind. Let's talk with David in Iowa. Good evening, Harry. Good evening. I just want to say I've been following, uh, following you since 96 uh, during your presidential campaign. I was a wee high school student then, and I, I bought your book and, and read it, and it, and it changed my or in 2000 or your, your original, your first uh, presidential campaign. Bought your book and changed my life. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Well, thank you. I appreciate it very much. What are you doing now? Oh, I'm just uh, wait, setting aside this time to, to listen to your program. Right now, I'm a, a student and, and working uh, when I'm uh, when, when I'm uh, at least I'm, when I'm able to save enough money to go to school. So uh, so that's kind of what I'm doing now. Hoping to graduate rather soon here. Ah, uh, uh, and you're a college student now, right? That's right. Uh, is there any kind of a libertarian, or, uh, pardon me, libertarian organization on your campus? What, what school is it, first of all? University of Iowa. Okay, that's in Ames, is it? That's in Iowa City. Iowa City. Oh, that's right. And is there any kind of a libertarian organization there? I believe there is, isn't there? Um, there has been in the past. Officially, not much. Not much as of late. Um, uh, I had a loose affiliation with the uh, with the National Party uh, recently, but but lately um, there hasn't really been much on campus as far as libertarian. Uh, uh, organizations. I would say he's a pretty liberal town, so there sure. are some libertarians around campus. We had a nice campaign rally there in 2000, I recall, and That's a right. lot of right. people showed up from the college. Um, well, look, uh, you might want to, if you have an extra hour or two a week, you might want to help organize some kind of group, and you don't have to think of it as necessarily this is a libertarian group that's going to change the world, but it's an opportunity for like-minded people to get together and just become associated and find things that they might like to help change at the university in Iowa City, in Iowa, or maybe in the nation. And in that way, uh, if you approach it from the standpoint that your goal, immediate goal is to just be able to associate with like-minded people, you find it very, very worthwhile. And then any good that you do is just icing on the cake. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, thanks so much for calling, David. We look forward to hearing from you again sometime. I was, wonder, I was wondering oh, about, yeah. you, Go ahead. You about your debate you had. Um, and uh, and the, if uh, the person you debate against tried to uh, pass off on to you or the audience the uh, terrorism and drug connection and saying how... Uh, you know, kind of when you smoke weed, you smoke weed with Bin Laden, kind of, kind of logic at all. Well, in the, uh, there was a question period when written questions were submitted, and one person in the audience asked what the U.S. attorney thought about the drug war ads, and didn't he think that they kind of spoiled the credibility of the drug warriors? And he said, well, I don't get a chance to watch much television, so I haven't seen much of those ads. And, of course, um, he was the one answering the question, so I didn't say anything. But when my turn came next, I said, gee, you're really missing a lot because these ads are really very entertaining. And I brought up the, the one about if you smoke marijuana, you're helping the terrorists and so on. And I, I said to the audience, why is it that the terrorists would want to – uh, smuggle marijuana or heroin or anything like that, why don't they get into the computer business? Look at all the money that Michael Dell and, and uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs have made in the computer industry. Why aren't they uh, smuggling computers and building computers and so on? And then, oh, yeah, that's right, It's because it's legal. And the profit margin is very thin because it's legal. But drugs are illegal, and this is the opportunity for them to make big money to finance their terrorist operations. And then, of course, the point of it all is that it isn't the marijuana smokers who are financing terrorism. It's the drug warriors who are creating the opportunity for the terrorists. And the audience got that point. There was no question about it. Incidentally, you reminded me of something, and that was that last week on the show, I said that if I didn't make a fool of myself and they had a, an audio recording of it, I would put it up on the website. And fortunately, both of those things came to pass. I didn't make a fool of myself, and they did record it. So sometime, probably it will be two or three weeks from now, I will put the uh, recording of the debate. It was an hour and a half. I'll put it up on the website, and people can listen to it then.
Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that today we have such a disconnection. You know, we think we're, we're somehow responsible for all the problems in that drug war. And I, I shouldn't say, you know, we, I guess I mean just the American people or people, let's just say they put it, the onus on people who use drugs. Yet years ago, um, I know my, my grandmother lived in downtown Chicago when she was newly married. She was young, and she went out to speakeasies at night. She used to tell me that. But she also <laughs> remembers having to hit the floor on her apartment a couple of times because there was gunfire, gunfire outside rather regularly when oh. the gangs were fighting. Oh, and, that's terrible. Yeah, but but at the same time, she never knew, she never made a connection that you know there was any sort of problem with you know in terms of uh you know the problem wasn't that that she was going out to speakeasies. The problem is that the country had had uh, adopted prohibition, mm-hmm. and you know, and so th- there's there's really not even a logical connection that, that people could ever could ever even come up with that somehow they're responsible for it. Intuitively, people realize that they're not. If anything, well, two points uh, that occurred to me. Number one, I started to touch on something earlier uh, in the opening monologue and then didn't really complete it, and that was that prohibition of alcohol lasted only 14 years. In 1933, people could remember what it was like before 1919. And so as a result, they knew very, very well what prohibition had caused and what other things were going on that had nothing to do with prohibition. Today, the drug war has been going on literally for 40 years. People talk about it starting with Nixon or with Reagan, but in fact, it started in the early 1960s. That's when the drug laws, which had been on the books for a long time, began to be enforced. And my point is, that people don't remember what it was like before the drug laws were enforced. People have no idea that there was a time in America when a 10-year-old girl could walk into a drugstore and buy heroin, and yet the country wasn't full of drug addicts. And as a result, as you're pointing out, they don't associate uh, many, many evils of prohibition with the crimes that are taking place in this country. They don't recognize that this is the result of Ill, uh, making drugs illegal rather than the result of the drugs themselves, such as the overdoses. People died of bathtub gin in alcohol prohibition, and because alcohol had been illegal for such a short period of time, they knew it was because they were drinking illegal uh, alcohol, drinking alcohol that was not coming from recognized distilleries. But today, people just associate that with drugs themselves, not the fact that they're getting illegal, toxic drugs from people that they don't know. So anyway, there is that. And whatever the second point I was going to make, oh yeah, I remember what it is. And that was that the attorney that I was debating was a Republican uh, appointed by George W. Bush. And it was amazing Uh, because I was stressing the importance of individual freedom, not just the freedom to put drugs in your own body if you want to, but the freedom to be left alone and make all your own decisions, provided you did what you agreed to do and provided you didn't intrude on someone else's person or property. And every time I started waxing on that subject, the audience got very interested and heads began to nod, and sometimes applause broke out at the end of my statement. And then when the U.S. attorney would get up, he would then say, well, I believe in individual freedom too, but we must weigh it against the public good, the common good. And we are moving more and more away from the idea in America that the individual should be free to do whatever he wants. And he even cited the restrictive smoking laws as uh, an indication of the direction America was going. And he didn't say, I welcome that. But he also didn't say that this was a bad trend. And he just kept coming back to the idea that we are all responsible for each other and that we all have to look out for each other. And what the difference between that and a socialist Democrat would be is really hard for me to define. Sounds like no difference at all. (laughs) No, not at all. David, thanks so much for calling. It's good to hear from you, and good luck to you there at the University of Iowa. Thank you. We now have Harvey in New Orleans back with us, so let's see what's going on in uh, the bayou. Harvey, are you with us? Yes, sir. Hi. I'm awfully sorry. I'm, I'm always, I am must have been con- – I didn't leave the phone. I had the phone right here, but I must have been concentrating on what I was going to say and concentrating on what you guys were talking about. That I didn't hear <laughs> That's all right. Oh. Oh. What, what is it you were going to say? Well, uh, our uh, friend Elwood has, uh, done, has done his usual top-notch investigating, and he has discovered some skulldudgery being pro- propagated by our favorite uh, member of Skull and Bones, uh, W., Okay. And what is that? Uh, He says that they have found out a way to uh, force the government under uh, Medicare to pay full price for the uh, whatever uh, drugs or you know, prescriptions that uh, that will be uh, given under Medicare. Yet the HMOs will be able to negotiate the uh, price uh, down. Let, let me let me get this straight. If the HMOs distribute the drugs to their customers, they will be able to negotiate special prices with uh-huh. the drug manufacturers. But right. if the government buys the drugs and distributes them through Medicare, then they will pay full price if, for them. If I understood uh, the, what he is saying, he, and uh, he's, he, you know, he could, uh, he's kind of tied up right now. That's why he isn't uh, called to alert you on this. But uh, this is, you know, this is uh, 
I don't think it's it's a fair thing because I, uh, I, I although I, I do I certainly don't want to see the drug companies put out of business. And, and uh, no, I understand what you're saying, but you know if this is true, and and of course we don't know yet that it is uh, because neither you nor I have read this bill, which is probably a thousand pages long, uh, but and probably nobody who is voting on it in Congress has read it either. <laughs> right. right. But if it is true, it would explain why George W. Bush has been so all fired enthusiastic about getting this bill through Congress and why he was willing to twist so many arms, and that is because of support from certain drug manufacturers who figure they're going to get a real windfall from this. Exactly. They gave him another, what is it, $100 million to run his campaign. Yeah, well, uh, there's one thing that there's no shortage of in the world, and that is money for George Bush's re-election campaign. <laughs> well, is, uh, I, if he uh, can't get in uh, this week, I'm sure he'll get in next week and can give you, or maybe he can email you the uh, particulars on how he found this out, but he does very good research. And uh, well, that's good. And, take it to the bank if he found something. And I would think that this next week there will be on the internet some summaries, uh, at least, of what's in that bill that Congress is passing. One place where you're likely to find something like that is LouRockwell.com. Uh, Lou Rockwell every day puts up a menu of about a dozen articles, and some of them are philosophical, some of them deal in general with issues of the day, and some of them are very particular details and facts about a bill that's passed in Congress or something that's going on in Iraq or whatever it may be that we're not getting from CNN or any of the other normal sources. And it's a very good place for people with a libertarian bent to get information in a hurry that they probably wouldn't come across elsewhere. And the website, I can't put it up on my Internet site because I'm not at home tonight, but it is www. Lou Rockwell, all one word, and Lou in this case is L E W. Oh, L E W. I had written L O U. Yeah, Rockwell is R O C K W E L L. So it's LouRockwell.com, and I strongly recommend it. And uh, another good thing about it, in my view, is that when I write my articles, which lately have been more like every other week, but generally speaking, are every week or so, Lou usually runs my articles on there too, or actually links to my website to my articles. He's and, the internet. Uh, he's the guy with the computer and the and the internet. I don't uh, have access to one, but I'm going to get. I'm going to give this. If he's not listening now, I'm going to give this information to him, and I'm sure he'll be glad for another source. He's a real uh, go-getter when it comes to doing things like that. Well, that's good, and I appreciate your uh, raising this. It's something to be looked into, and I'll uh, kind of browse around on the Internet during the week and see if I can come up with any particulars about the uh, Medicare bill. Uh, it is really interesting that Republicans are all f so f fired up about getting this bill through. And you, you, can see a, you can see a Republican talk show in which they're, uh, in one breath, we'll talk about a smaller government, limited government, constitutional government, and in the next breath saying they've got to get that Medicare uh, prescription drug bill through. Harvey, thanks so much for calling. For I'm there. glad to hear from you again. And we're going to go now to Pittsburgh and talk with Rob, just as promised. Good evening, Rob. Hi, Harry Brown. Good to talk to you again. Um, you know, in that last conversation you had uh, with a caller, you uh, were talking about that prescription drug uh, plan. And mm -hmm. it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from Harry Brown. I, I quote you all the time with this one. is Republicans campaign like libertarians and govern like Democrats. Oh, yes. It's one of my favorite quotes. There's a lot of good quotes from you, but that's one of my favorites. But here's yes, and of course the, the reasoning behind it is that every time they do campaign for re-election, they go on and on about the evils of big government and how we've got to do something to stop this juggernaut and so forth. And, of course, during 2000, George Bush talked about limited constitutional government and a humble foreign policy and all these other things. And then, of course, once he was in office, uh, precisely the opposite happens, and he does govern. Uh, well, I, I would say he governs like a Democrat, except even Democrats might be ashamed at some of the things he's been doing. Yeah, well, I mean, I have friends of various religions and various political parties and, um, <coughs> excuse me, and socio-political economic philosophies and whatnot. And so some of my friends are Republicans, and some of them just don't get it. You know, they really, they keep thinking that if they vote for the lesser of two evils, that they're going to get something good out of it, and they just don't, they haven't got it yet. But um, well, one of the things I wanted to tell you that happened since last time I talked to you is, like, last time I talked to you, I told you that I finally re-registered to vote, changing from Democrat to Libertarian, and I'm waiting for my uh, new voters card to come still. But in the meantime... <laughs> I finally joined the Libertarian Party at the local and county level. Um, so the next two steps for me would be to join at the state and national levels. Um, I don't know when I'll be doing that. I uh, have to set some money aside for that at some point. But at least I, I, I'm finally officially uh, one of you guys now, I guess. Huh? Okay. Well, it isn't, uh, of course, so much the party affiliation as just uh, simply recognizing in your own life that this is the way you want to be and that you're no longer going to support people who are making government bigger because whether or not they may label themselves or somebody else may label them as the lesser of two evils, the fact is if they're the lesser of two evils, they're still evil. Well, that's true, but I mean, the reason that I felt strongly about changing my registration and actually joining the party is because, well, joining the party, you give a little bit of financial support to, to become a member, sure. and I feel that the party needs that. And I think that the party needs members, and I think that the party needs um, statistics. I just wanted to be counted statistically as no longer a Democrat. Yeah, I think, that's a, I think that's a very good point. And 
over a period of time, if enough people do that, then the media will take the party more seriously and take libertarian ideas more seriously. And, of course, there's always the hope that Republicans or Democrats may get the message that they're going to have to alter their behavior a bit if they want to keep people in their parties, uh, because otherwise those, a lot of those people are going to migrate to the libertarian position. And, of course, the more people that are libertarians, the easier it is for others to make that migration. When it seems as though they're just one of a few people in the country, then what's the point? But yeah, because yeah, a lot of people I know say things like, oh, yes, I understand what you're saying, and I agree the government needs to be smaller, but the libertarians don't have enough power to make a difference, and they probably never will, so why should I join them? And Absolutely. It's like, it's that sort of thing. Now, the local Libertarian Party here in Pittsburgh, are having a the party is having a party around Christmas time in December. And uh, I don't know if you know this. Guess who our guest speaker is going to be? He's been on your show. Who's that? Uh, presidential uh, hopeful uh, Gary Nolan. Oh, well, that's nice. That's it. Uh, you're in Pittsburgh, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's good. Uh, Gary's a pretty good speaker. I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. We're pretty excited about it. Good. Well, okay, Rob. Thanks so much for checking in tonight. Anytime uh, you have anything to say, we'll be glad to hear it. Right now, we're going to go to California and talk with George. Good evening, George. Well, a very good evening to you, Harry. Um, I'd like to tell you that little deal you were talking about, that smoking ban that has caught on. Unfortunately, it started here in San Luis Obispo, and it, it took off. I mean, I have a very good friend of mine that doesn't smoke, but he won't uh, go to any of the restaurants in town because of that smoking ban. I think it's, you know, I, I hate this benevolent government thinking for us. That's something that jaws me to no end. Yes, and it's an interesting thing, too, and I've made this point before, so forgive me anyone who's heard it before. The separation in restaurants between smokers and non-smokers started long before any legislation was passed in Absolutely. any town, state, or uh, in the nation. The uh, the idea that some people who were non-smokers did not want to be exposed to cigarette smoke created smoking and non-smoking mm-hmm. sections. And then, of course, the government has to jump on the bandwagon, and what is not compl- uh, what is not forbidden must now be made mandatory, and that is to, to separate the smokers. And then eventually it was only a small step from that to banning smoking altogether in restaurants and bars in some cities around the country, and it's getting more and more. In fact, this U.S. attorney cited the fact that one in one uh, uh, city in the country, and he couldn't think of the name of the city, but he said in one city of the country they have already banned all smoking out of one's home. Now that is totally, you know, to me the whole thing, I always said this, it was my constitutional right to make a damn fool out of myself if I wanted to, and unfortunately <laughs> the government's getting involved. Just like another thing, you were talking about this deal um, where they had prohibition, now we've got the war on drugs. I'll tell you what the next war is going to be. It's already started, but it's going to really take off, and that's the war on uh, private ownership of firearms. Oh, of course, that's been going on for uh, half a century now. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's uh, very interesting that so many conservatives are concerned about protecting gun rights but are in favor of the drug war, and so many liberals are concerned about ending the drug war but are in favor of gun laws. And, in fact, the two are just two sides of the same coin. Yeah. You should never be prosecuted for what you own, for what you believe, for what you think, for what you smoke, for what you drink, for what you put in your body. You should be prosecuted only for the harm you do to someone else. And if you do harm to someone else, you should be prosecuted, whether or not there's liquor on your breath or hate in your heart. Yeah, it goes back to the golden rule. Well, that's just like I can remember uh, my mom, who, who died last year. She was 98. I heard my grandmother were talking about they remember when you could go get elixir of opium and you could get uh, drugs like that. And she said she wasn't in denial. Yeah, there were drug addicts, but it's not like it is now. And during Prohibition with the bathtub gin and all that, a lot of these people, it was the chic and vogue thing to do. Hey, it's illegal. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Yes, visit a speakeasy. You know, dare me to get caught type of thing. Yeah, right. Very good. Well, she would be old enough to, to remember that uh, without question. And uh, as you say, she wasn't in denial. She knew that there were drug addicts, but it was these were personal tragedies then. They were not a national crisis. Absolutely. And what we have today is a national crisis because of the illegality of drugs. Harry, another thing, too, like this deal of the war against tobacco. I have a good friend of mine who's also retired military, and he's living up in Canada had a couple of convenience stores, and you know how Canada got on the moral uh, bandwagon about smoking uh, a pack of cigarettes up there was around five or six Canadian dollars, and he said that he'd had his stores robbed several times. They'd go in there and say, no, we're not going to take the money, we're going to take the cigarettes. Right. And all the black market activity and the RCMP and the Canadian Border Service and all that, they weren't worried about looking for illegal drugs and firearms coming into the country. They got so tied up on the war on tobacco. And I thought to myself, come on, people, just let people make their own decisions and all that. Keep, you know, keep... um, the prices as they were, and things will be fine. Sure. Did you say it was your mother or your grandmother that just died at 98? My mother. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, I know that even though it was long expected, it was a great loss for you, and you have my condolences. But at the same time, she was an inspiration uh, that she could live till 98. And I salute her, and I salute you, and I thank you so much for calling, George. Oh, one other thing. Sure. Your theme music you got, I thoroughly enjoy that. What's the name of it? Which one are you talking about? Oh, you've got different uh, pieces of music that come there, and I like this type of music. I'm going, boy, that is so relaxing. Yeah, the, the piece that was played just at the start of this segment was 
from a piece called Symphonic Sketches by George Chatwick, who was an American composer of the 19th century. The theme that starts the hour, mm -hmm. each of the two hours, is the Brahms First Symphony, uh, one segment of the Brahms First Symphony. Harry, you keep it up. I enjoy it. Thanks so much, George. Have a good day. You too. Let's go to New Orleans now and talk with Steve. Good evening, Steve. Good evening, Harry. How's it going? Uh, I'm just fine. How are you doing, and what's on your mind? Uh, well, I was just listening. Uh, I heard you. I want to know. I want you to repeat what the, uh, the uh, attorney you had uh, debated with. I want you to repeat what he said. He said he believed in individual freedom, but what? He said that he he valued individual freedom too, but that this had to be balanced against the common good or the public interest. Or he, he used several different phrases because he kept coming back to this several times, and I guess he kept coming back to it because I kept coming back to individual freedom. One of the the themes that I stressed was that we have to decide what kind of country we want. Yeah. Do we want a country where the where people like Teddy Kennedy, Jesse Helms, Newt Gingrich, Trent Lott, and Bill Clinton are making decisions for everybody about their personal lives, or do we want a country where people take responsibility for their own lives? And you, and you said he was a Bush appointee. Yes. Which started cool with me, because weren't the Republicans giving, giving Hillary Clinton all kind of... Uh, oh, sure. They were giving her for her book, uh, It Takes a Village, and, and as, as a parent, they had the same <laughs> that's philosophy. A good point. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. I'd forgotten about that title. It Takes a Village to Raise a Child. That's right. And, and uh, now the Republicans are telling us that it takes a whole nation to run your life for you. <laughs> yeah. And I had gotten arrested for possession of marijuana back in May. Actually, and it's, it's it's nothing but a big headache. Um, you know, I have to pay two hundred dollars to get out of jail, and now I have to pay three hundred dollars to to the DA, so I won't get prosecuted. It seems to me like it's just all a money game. It's it's basically extortion. Well, tell us about the three hundred dollars you paid to the DA. Oh, they have a, uh, what's called a diversion program, which if it's your first offense for possession, you can pay them and agree to go to drug screenings. And I go to a drug screen about once every two weeks. And I paid actually it was three hundred and fifty dollars to the DA, and they agreed to not prosecute me. It's like a three month program, and it's I don't know, it's, it's pretty much extortion. I mean, they you know either I pay them or they can prosecute me, and I'm probably going to go to jail. Oh my! Um, well, listen, that's just special. Isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, right. And it really hasn't changed my mind any. I mean, yeah, of course. Uh, I you know I like to smoke pot. I don't understand. It's a, it's a victim of crime. I don't consider it a crime. You know, I'm an American. I should live in a free country. I'm not hurting anyone, and I don't know. I, I just don't get it. It, it 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 really 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 aggravates me. Yeah, well, I'm not surprised. I'm just glad you're not in jail. Uh, yeah, I'm glad I'm not in jail either. I'm doing pretty good in the program. I actually haven't smoked pot, but I mean, if, if there was a way to get around it, I would. You of know? course, of course, <laughs> and, uh, and if you knew enough people, you'd probably know somebody who knew a way to get around it. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, I agree. I agree with you. Uh, I, it's the first time I heard the show in a long time. Actually, I voted for you last time you ran, and you know, I love the show. I'm start listening to it again. I remember you on Sunday nights a while back. Oh yeah, well, we moved. To, uh, I guess it was at the beginning of this year we moved to Saturdays. Yeah. And uh, uh, Well, that's great, Steve. I appreciate your calling and filling us in, and uh, join us in the fun any time that you like. Sure thing, Mr. Brown. So anyway, we made it through the two hours, and a few closing thoughts. In the debate that I had with the U.S. Attorney in Sacramento this past week over the drug war, I, as I mentioned earlier, said that we need to decide what kind of country we want. Do we want to live in a country where everybody's responsible for everyone else, which means that in the final analysis, the government will make the decisions for everyone. And in the final analysis, that means people like Bill Clinton, George Bush, Trent Lott, uh, Newt Gingrich, Teddy Kennedy, and Chuck Schumer are going to be making decisions about your life. Or do we want a country in which people make their own decisions and are responsible for themselves and are responsible for their acts and pay attention to the consequences of their acts? And the attorney countered that by saying that he too would like to have the kind of country that I describe, but that we aren't there yet, that we have a country in which people aren't responsible and in which people have to be governed by the powers that be in Washington because they are not acting responsibly. Fortunately, I got a chance to talk about that again before the debate was over. And I pointed out, as I would point out to you, that if you want people to be more responsible and you think that they have to be more responsible before you can set them free and before you can repeal all of these laws, then you are wishing for something that will never happen. Because as long as Washington and the state capitol and the city hall are making all our decisions for us, we can't possibly be responsible because responsibility comes from facing the consequences of your own acts, not having other people make decisions for you. And if you want people in this country to become more responsible, there is only one course of action that makes sense, and that is to set them free. Set them free to make their own decisions. Set them free to face the consequences of their own acts, to learn what happens when they act this way or that way or that way. Only then do they learn from it. Only then, by paying the price for the things that they do, only then will they act responsibly. And only then will we have the kind of country that we want. But if we wait for people in these circumstances to become more responsible, we will wait forever. It simply is not going to happen. And what we have come to in this country is Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals, people seemingly of all stripes, but really not, but seemingly of all stripes, who think that government must be the solution for every problem. Is there a scandal in the financial world? Oh, we need new laws. 
Well, if the laws worked, that scandal never would have happened in the first place. We've had an SEC for 70 years, and still we have financial scandals like the Martha Stewart thing, the mutual fund business that came up this past week, the foreign exchange trading, and so on. These things would not happen if government worked because we have had more government than we know what to do with for a long, long time now, and it hasn't prevented any of these terrible things from happening, at least terrible in the eyes of the politicians. If we want a country in which people are responsible, in which people stand tall, in which people take care of their children, in which people worry about the consequences of their acts, then we have got to set them free. And we must restore the time-honored concepts of buyer beware, of people looking out for themselves and people not buying something until they're satisfied, it's safe, and it will do what it is that they want to be done by the product. And only then will we get the kind of country that we want. We are not going to get it from Washington. We are not going to get it with a $2 trillion federal budget. We are not going to get it with more state and local laws. We are not going to get it with more regulation. We are going to get it only when we begin repealing all of these laws at all levels and reduce government to the absolute minimum possible. And the first step in that direction comes from you tuning in again next week <laughs> for the Harry Brown Show. I'm so glad you tuned in this week, and I look forward to talking with you again next week. I won't be home next week, but I should be in a studio in North Carolina. And I look forward to talking with you then. This is Harry Brown. Good night. <laughs>